thank you all for joining in. My name is Gautam Chattopadhyay uh, that you have heard. So I work for NASA and we can land a rover on Mars, but you know, sometimes we cannot really fix the PowerPoint presentations or the WebEx problems. Uh, so we'll have to do something about it for sure. Uh, again, uh, uh, good morning, everyone. And thank you all for joining in and inviting me to talk to you all. I'm really excited uh, to be here. And when I was contacted to talk uh, you know, for this lecture, then I was thinking what I should talk about. And I was told that I should talk about my life's journey uh, to NASA. As, so I thought that I, in addition, I'll also talk about NASA's search for life outside our planet Earth. So let's begin with myself. So I grew up uh, in a very small village outskirts of Kolkata, it's called Nobogram. So it is my journey from Novogram to NASA. Like many others, I grew up in uh, utter poverty. So we, have, we grew up in a single room home of 12 foot by 14 foot. And I am one of the six siblings. My parents really struggled uh, to feed us. And we sometimes we did not even get two meals a day. As a kid, if you cannot uh, you know, you, if your stomach is not full, then in the night you cannot fall asleep. And then, you know, in those nights, I used to dream. For people who has this poor economic background, you should always know that it doesn't cost anything to dream. And I used to dream big. Uh, we could not afford newspapers. At home. And so what uh, I used to go and read newspaper in the local club and from end to end. And there I used to read about the space exploration, NASA and Richard Feynman from Caltech. So these things actually had a lot of uh, big impression on me. And I used to dream about those places. My parents always told us one thing that for people like us, only way out is work hard and study well. All six of us, we actually did. And then I landed up at Bengal Engineering College, the second oldest engineering college in India. I did undergraduate from there. And after that, I had to take up a job and I joined uh, TIFR, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where they were building the largest meter wavelength telescope called GMRT, Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. And there I actually met the big scientists like Professor Govind Swaru, as well as Professor Jayant Nalikar, Many of you know, Jan Planikar is a really stalwart in red astrophysics. And there actually my eyes opened. So I wanted to study more. So I applied to US. First, I came to University of Virginia uh, to do my master's. And from there, I went to Caltech, California Institute of Technology. And Caltech is actually a very small university. There are only 2000 students there, 900 undergraduate students and 1100 graduate students but it produced 42 Nobel Prizes. 41 people got Nobel Prizes from Caltech and one of them got two, you know, Linus Pauling. So when I got admission there, I was really, you know, I used to think that, am I still dreaming of those dreams that I used to dream as a kid? Because I was surrounded by people who were really smart. So even though I was doing a PhD at, in the electrical engineering department, uh, my advisor was in physics and from my graduate student's office, two doors from my office, every winter, Professor Stephen Hawking used to come and sit there. And I used to go and talk to him and people who used to come and talk to him are, you know, future Nobel laureates. Many of you know, Kip Thorne and Barry Barish, they got Nobel Prize for physics to, for discovering the gravitational waves. So they used to come and talk. So it was a very different environment. So I was really thrilled. Uh, to be, you know, studying uh, with people who knew so much. And then when it, uh, it uh, you know, time came for my graduation and I was thinking what I should do. And one day I got a call from NASA saying that they, uh, you know, want me to go and give a talk to NASA. And I was really thrilled. I went there and they hired me. So I, you know, sometimes people say that our dreams do not come true. In my case, it did. I am so happy that I'm working for NASA. You know, NASA is an amazing place to work at. 
never ever in the morning when I woke up on a you know, uh, rainy day on Monday morning, I never think that I'll have to go to work. I'm excited to go to work. This has been my journey from you know, Nobogram to NASA. That's how I landed up there. Now I've talked a little bit about what we do. What do we do at NASA? Many of you knew that actually we do develop technologies and make all these missions, but the fundamental you know, reason behind NASA's existence is doing science. We want to do big science. We want to answer this, the most burning science questions that we have. And for that, we need we develop technologies to make those science happen. If you think about it, one of the biggest questions that human beings, as a human being that we have is, are we alone in this universe? Is there life outside our planet Earth? When I give lectures at many places, people ask me, what do I think? What is my opinion about it? Before I say what I think, let me make one thing very clear. We have not found any sign of life anywhere outside our planet Earth. So whatever you read about aliens on YouTube or anywhere else, don't believe them. We have not found even a single cell anywhere outside our planet Earth. So having said that, the question is, is, the, is there possibility of existence of life outside our planet? My answer to that, yes. The possibility and the probability of finding life is, life is finite. Why do I say that? If you think about it and do a back of the envelope calculation, in our galaxy, we have about 100 billion stars. You know, we live in our Milky Way galaxy and the stars are like our sun is a star. So we have about 100 billion stars in our own galaxy. And in this universe, we have about 100 billion galaxies, order of magnitude. If you do the math, now you know that in our universe, we have about 10 to the power 22 to 10 to the power 23 number of stars. This is huge. And we are finding increasingly that many, majority of these stars, they have planets. Not only planets, they have more than one planet. Like our planet, you uh, know, our sun has eight planets. Similarly, we are finding that most of the stars, they have multiple planets. The question is, this, amongst these you know, trillions and trillions of planets that exist outside, what is the probability of finding one such planet where conditions are such that life could exist? Mathematically, statistically, that probability has to be non-zero. And that's why the NASA's biggest quest is to find life outside our planet. And so far, actually, we have found, we have detected about 5,000 these outside planets, they're called exoplanets. It is not very easy to detect uh, these exoplanets. So you might say that I said there should be trillions and trillions of uh, planets, then why we only found about 5,000? The reason for that is uh, we do not have the technology to look very far. So, so far, the planets that we have detected, they are in our own galaxy, our Milky Way galaxy. So we need to develop technologies. We really need to develop new technologies to come up with new ideas so that we can build instruments, to look beyond, look much far, further, and then we can detect uh, you know, other planets. We can study the other planets and we can find out whether life can exist. So which are the planets we are looking for to find life? You know, the, we, are, there are, we are looking for primarily the, um, you know, planet, rocky planets, because our Jupiter is a gaseous giant, but Jupiter kind of planet cannot have life. So we need to have kind of life that we know about is the hydrocarbon based life. And for that life to exist, we need the planet has to be a rocky planet and not only that we call something in the habitable zone so which are the planets which are in the habitable zone where life can exist the planets which are not too far from the parent star and the conditions are such that the surface temperature of those planets are such that water can exist 
in the liquid form. And if that is the case, then hydrocarbon-based life can exist in those planets. You might ask me that, okay, what about other kind of life that we have no idea about? Absolutely, we can actually stumble upon those kind of life. But how do you actually search for the life which you, have, you don't know anything about? We cannot actively search for something that we don't know about. You know, the uh, Nobel laureate poet Rabindranath Tagore had written a beautiful actually song, in Bengali song. And in one of the lines in that song, I'm a Bengali, so I'm a big fan of Tagore, as you might, uh, you know, imagine. And one of the line is, Janar majhe ajanare kure chi shandhan, which says that we are trying to find the unknown with what we know. So that is very much applicable here because we always trying to find the unknown through our own knowledge base that what we know and that's what is happening here. Many of you know that we actually sent the Perseverance rover recently to Mars. So one of the question is why do we go back to Mars? Why do we spend billions of dollars going back to Mars? The reason is that we are actually trying to find out was Mars ever habitable? In this early uh, history, Mars was very much like our planet Earth. There are a lot of similarities between our current conditions, our planet Earth, and what Mars used to be. So the question is, is there life on Mars today? Was there life on Mars at any point of time in the past? What happened if there was life and doesn't exist today? Where did it go? So this is the big question that we are trying to answer and that's why we are actually sending all these missions and Perseverance is one such mission. The main goal of the Perseverance rover has been to actually find life on Mars, actually the sign of life on Mars. So we, uh, at, uh, we chose the location very carefully, it's called the Zero Crater and there it, it used to be a lake bed at one point of time. And if you go to Mars today, you don't find a lot of water. Most of the water is underground. A little bit of water is there. But at one point of time on Mars, there was flowing water. The question is, where did it go? And there was even lakes, big lakes. Like this Jezero crater, is, there was a lake bed. So lake beds are a prime target for existence of life. And that's why we are collecting samples. So one of the things that we are doing with the Perseverance rover is Mars sample return. So we are collecting, the rover is going around and drilling holes and collecting materials of the chalk size, you know, chalk that you write on the blackboard. That chalk size material we are collecting from different areas because we cannot send all the equipment, all the instruments to Mars to do the experiments. So we can bring some material back from Mars, then we'll be able to know more. And that's what we are doing. We are collecting those materials and they're putting in a contain containers and leaving it there on the ground. There will be another mission that will go to Mars in 2026 time frame. What that will do is there will be a lander there. The lander will go around and the rover will go around and collect all the sample that you collected today and put in a kind of a container, like a ball, and then it will launch in Martian atmosphere and it will become a satellite around Mars. And then there will be another mission in 2030 that will go and capture that material and bring it back to Earth. So that's when we'll be able to do those experiments. These are very exciting times. We need to develop a lot of new technologies. And that's what we are doing. That's why I'm so excited to talk to you all about this. So you might ask what you are all doing MBA, you know, business administration, what role you can play. Why I'm talking to you about all these science and stuff. You know, we, the space science is a multidisciplinary subject. We need people from all kinds of background. We need physicists, we need chemists, biochemists, engineers, all kinds of mechanical engineers, thermal engineers, you name it. But we also need people who can manage. NASA's yearly budget is about $20 billion. Who is going to, you know, $20 billion is a big number and it's like a big company, right? So we need people like you who have good management skills who can come and help us.
so we are i am talking to you so do not consider that you cannot work at nasa or maybe you are not going to make this you know uh, millions of dollars that you can you will be making from being a ceo of a big 100 billion dollar company but it will be very exciting so i'll urge you to think about it and come and join us with that i'll end